so this is a, a little nerve-wracking. Um, uh, so first of all, you know, my, my title is, Am I Crazy Lord? Is How do I know all this God and church stuff is real? And, and looking out the audience, I know a lot of people in here, so I'm going to guess there is probably a little extra motivation tonight that you're thinking that you're going to come down tonight and finally Paul is going to confess what uh, you have already known long, you know, long, that, long ago that you know, maybe I have a couple screws loose, but you know. for those who, do, who, don't, who don't know me, uh, I'll, I'll allow you to come up with your opinion by the end, but um, it's, it's kind of a topic near and dear to my heart, and I, I'll kind of get to it, um, but it is a little nerve-wracking, uh, because, you know, I am an engineer, and, uh, you know, I've been an engineer for 15 years, and um, I, I've given lots of presentations to, to, like, you know, VPs and things like that on things I've, I've done. It's all very factual, right? You know, you have data, you, you try to. Uh, <laughs> so, it, you know, you, you try to develop a story about, hey, you know, this is something good, this is something bad, and giving a recommendation. And, you know, I, I, I guess I can say in my career I've done a pretty good job at that. And, um, you know, I feel very comfortable in that kind of setting where you're presenting facts. And, uh, you know, what? so this talk is more about faith, and that's, it's, that, that's where things get a little bit not as black and white, right? Um, because everybody walks, you know, walks a different um, uh, journey through their life, you know, how they, um, you know, connect with God and, um, or struggle to connect with God. And everybody kind of has a different, different road. Um, but it, it, it all means something, and it's, and it's all interrelated. Um, and so, um, there's no pulling here, so kind of for, forgive me if I look down time to time here. Um, but I, I guess my, the, the courage for coming tonight is that I, I really, really enjoy this series because it's, you know, I, I can look around the room and, you know, see how people are in different, you know, phases of their life, you know, and, and how they're, um, you know, many people coming out of school, people who have families, old people. <laughs> 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 and it's really neat that we come to one building and we have to remember like all our differences that we have in our you know different faiths that we have that we do have more more in common than um, than what we think we do even though there there are a lot of differences that you know we butt heads at times and so um, you know I believe in, in in what I'm going to you know talk about tonight so I, I guess it's uh, for me, uh, leave it up to the Holy Spirit and to guide what I say tonight, hopefully guide what you hear tonight. So if I say something really odd or funny, I, I guess I'm counting on the Holy Spirit to, to be my filter for your ears. So somehow it'll change the words to, to make it a little bit more meaningful for you. Um, so, you know, so that gives me comfort. Comfort. Uh, you have to introduce yourself since your last one. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'm a little nervous about, hey, how is this going to take, because I, I, I think in you know, all my engineering uh, presentations, I always, you're know, always very motivated to try to convince somebody that, okay, at the end of the day, he's going to prove this or, or not. And, and this, you know, it's very likely that at the end of it, you know, just because we're all on, on different wavelengths in our faith, um, that, you know, maybe some things will stick really well, and maybe for, for some people it, it won't, but... Um, you know, if, if I could just touch one person tonight, or you know, one little part that I say tonight, you can kind of leave here tonight. Then, you know, amen to that, and I, I can you know hold my head up high from that. So, um, before getting in like the, the meat of this, um, it, you know, there was actually kind of a study that I I had read. It was on uh, NPR. If you Google this, um, it, it'll come up, and you can kind of read the full story. Uh, but it was actually the Pew Research Company, which is a pretty reputable. Uh, company that, and they uh, did a big survey and they studied nuns and I'm not talking about the, the habit wearing N-U-N-S but N-O-N-E-S nuns being that on a survey that they are that they take when asked the question is that are you affiliated with any religion or any belief um, one of the questions one of the answers is none and so they did this big study and in, in 1950 um, two percent um, of the people in America said that they they are not affiliated with any faith at all. Um, I, I don't know the exact extent. You know, I don't know whether that meant uh, do you at least believe, but you don't belong to church. But so then they compared and they went up to 2008. So what do you think that if you had to guess, this is the first audience participation uh, of, of the night. What take some guesses on what do you think in America for all ages? What do you think 
the percent of people write none for religious affiliation? Twelve percent? Thirty. Thirty to forty. Thirty? Forty-five. Forty-five? Wow. Thirty-two and a half. Sixteen percent. Sixteen percent. So that's, that's a pretty big uh, increase. And do you know what it is between 18 and 29 year olds? 50? <laughs> It's double that, it's 32%. This was 2008. And my guess is if you know, uh, you just look out seven years, probably the numbers are a little bit higher. And so, it, you know, when I, when I see that stuff, and um, first of all, I had to put this in there because I'm an engineer and I had to put something numbers related to maybe get comfortable talking about stuff. Uh, so that kind of spoke to me for a couple of reasons. One, I, I guess it makes me to pause and think it's like, okay, uh, you know, I, I, I circled something else on that on that survey. A am I missing something? Is is uh, is, is our uh, in a world where we think that we're getting constantly smarter? Am I you know left out in the cold here, thinking that you know I'm not catching on to something at all? You know, a good example is is uh, smartphones, right? Well, I, for the last two and a half years, I, I can be proud to say if I, I've had a smartphone. I don't know why I never had a smartphone, but I was very stubborn to, to finally pony up and pay a, a little extra month and finally get a smartphone. Um, but I, I don't know what you would do without a smartphone for this for like my job. It, it makes a lot of things easier, even though there are distractions. Um, but that's kind of an example that you know sometimes you know when when you see change around you. You have to stop and think about, okay, is this, is this a real change that I need to react to? Or is there something else um, um, off balance? And so I, I really stop and pause about that because this alley properly um, said about my background is that, you know, I'm a cradle Catholic, which means that, you know, I was born in a Catholic family. You know, both sides were Catholic. Um, Grand, you know, just we were very involved in the church. I mean, there was there was no debate about are we going to go to mass on Sunday. We we went to mass on Sunday, and uh, even have a even have an uncle who's a priest, and is, you know, it's definitely a unique um, uh, blessing to our family, and, and uh, it's, it's very close to us. So, defining who I am, I, you know, one thing I would say is that I'm I'm a Catholic, you know, and I take great pride in that. But it also makes me pause and think, it's like, okay, well, am I only Catholic just because? You know, my parents are Catholic, and, and I was just in a, in a you know, uh, in a setting where, you know, everything around me was Catholic. I, I went to Catholic grade school and then high school and even a, a great college university. Um, <laughs> and uh, so it definitely makes me to pause because I, I think you could easily say that, hey, everything around me was good, and, and that would be a true statement. But is it, is it really the truth about, hey, um, you know, my Catholic faith is really... Uh, does it have true meaning behind that? Um, or is it more of a comfort thing that, hey, everyone around me is, is work, you know, I'm very comfortable with, and, and it seems like these are our nice people, most, most people, and, and uh, you know, I can live my life knowing that, hey, this is good, and I'm living a good life. And so I, I think if I ask a show of hands, has anybody ever, for maybe a split second, ever, ever had a similar uh, you know, doubt of, hey, you know, is all this real? At one at one point in your life, I, hopefully everyone raises their hand. If not, you know, I don't know why you're here tonight, you know. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, there's, especially in the culture we live in, I, I think there's plenty of distractions to, to, to show to us that, hey, what the, the life that, you know, where you go on Sunday is totally different than um, um, everything else. And, and for me, it's... It, you know, makes me question a lot of things, and and, and then things to Cummins. You know, there's a uh, there's a there's kind of a training program where you go through and you take this test, and uh, it tells you you know your communication style, and you know one field is you know uh, conformist or non-conformist, and I was so far off the track on being a non-conformist uh, that I was like, well, that that does make sense. So any times where I think that okay, am I just doing something because someone else? Uh, told me to do it, I, I'm always going to be like very hesitant. Um, so hopefully you see that I am Catholic and, and you know my, my non-Catholic friends would, would probably look at my Catholic faith saying it's like, oh my gosh, that is the most conformist religion that there is out there. And um, for, for me, I guess my, my first, you know, what I'm going to talk about is like how, you know, at least I process through um, all that to maybe see that there is a little bit more um, than, than just being around people that are good, you know. Because uh, that's not what we're called to be, just good. Uh, there's a little bit more than that. 
And so, you know, before I go into the, the actual, you know, the kind of the points that maybe I would hope that you would take away from, from here, um, I, I try to think of a good way to kind of segue into that. And, um, you know, a lot of things that, you know, I thought, thought about in the, the body of that uh, was in a kind of a class I took, um, you know, last semester for, I took a kind of a grad school class for, just for fun. And uh, so there was, there was a lot of things that was very eye-opening. I was like, okay, this is, this is exactly what I think our generation really wants to, is yearning to hear. And uh, I was trying to think of a segue into that. And um, um, I went to Good Friday service. Um, and, you know, I, I love Holy, you know, the whole Holy Week and leading up to kind of the greatest, um, you know, celebration we have in, in the church, which is, you know, celebrating what, Christ did after he died, which is, you know, he rose from the dead, he now lives forever. And uh, so before you get to that one point, you have to go to Good Friday, which is actually the day that he died. And uh, so here's a, here's a Catholic trivia question, what, what, what big, unique thing do we do at, at Good Friday service that's different than any other service? Keep the tabernacle doors open. There's What's no, that? You leave the tabernacle doors wide open, there's no Eucharist. No, no actually oh. in the service, like what, what does the whole community do that's, that's different? Veneration of the cross. Veneration of the cross, right? So I don't know if anybody's been to that before. Um, it's, it's different than maybe a Catholic apologetics uh, 101 here about, okay, what is veneration of the cross? You know, are you, is this the worshiping, you know, objects? And for, first of all, no, we don't worship objects. Uh, we, you know, um, just like in your home, you have pictures of, of loved ones on the wall. And when you walk by and you see that love, you know, that picture of that loved one, you know, because God gave us five senses, you know, the, the sense of, of, you know, sight, when we see that, you know, it, it stirs something in us, right? You know, that's why we love taking pictures, you know, every, every phone now has a camera and, and we're, 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 uh, we're drawn to pictures because it brings up memories, it, it kind of stirs emotion within us. And that's really what you know, venerating uh, the cross means to us, is that we, we look at the symbol of our salvation and we pause and we think about, hey, this is this is where it happened. And so what, what we do in that service is that we go up and we basically pay respect to that symbol. Not that we were worshiping that object, that that is a god or anything like that, but we stop and pause and think, okay, what, what happened there? Um, you know, why, why is the symbol so powerful for us in, in our faith? So we, we go up and, and you can do, you can just kind of touch it, say a little prayer yourself, um, you know, bend down on one knee or, or even kiss the cross just as a show of, of appreciation for what you know really, really happened there. And, and to be honest, uh, it's, so in that service, I, I was like one of five uh, men who actually carried the cross in and we were just staying, you know, standing there making sure it didn't tip over. And So I saw everybody come up and it, it's just really neat because you see the community come up and really, you know, um, think about what this really means. and. And I say it's kind of funny because there's there's also uh, you know there, there's kids there and they're walking up. This is not something we normally do. And they're like, oh, what? you can just tell the look of fear. Like, okay, what what should I do? You know, what did that person do? Well, did that person really kiss the cross? And and and, and it, it it made me pause for a second because you know getting to this fact of you know is this really true? What really happened? I, I can't think of anything crazier than everybody coming up. You know, and, and you know in these long lines and. and kissing a cross that just two pieces of wood tie together and, and so if that's not true then you know there's you know there, there's something going on that um, you can say that hey we're crazy it's like that that really didn't happen um, but you know pausing for a second and you know on Good Friday we always read the passion from um, John's gospel and, and for me John's gospel is really really neat because if, if you look at the things that Jesus says in that gospel Jesus is always in full control. And there's not a better example during that passion is that he's up, you know, he's talking to Pilate, you know, the most powerful man in the land that, that holds, you could say, his fate um, in, in his hands. And, and Pilate, first of all, is confused out his mind about, okay, what, what did this guy do? And he's trying to ask all these questions. And, and it's like Jesus is just being Joe Cool. He's just up there just giving these very nonchalant answers and actually frustrating Pilate. And so it comes to a, a point where Pilate says, um, um, are you king of the Jews, that these other people say? And, and Jesus says, no. Um, well, he's, he says, you say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. 
choice and Pilate, the most powerful man in the land who, who is supposed to be, you know, everybody looks to says, what is truth? And, and I just remember that line and, and, and putting it in perspective of that whole day and thinking about, is, is that not what all of us constantly ask for when, you know, when, we, when we're talking to ourselves and, and very frustrated about things? It's like, okay, what, what is true? What, what, what is right or wrong? What, what is it that I need to be doing? And, it, and it's, I think, very ironic that the most powerful man there is, is perplexed with the same question. And so we have to ask, okay, what is, what is truth? And that's what Jesus came for, is to testify to the truth that, you know, he, he is God and, and it's, you know, he yearns for us to love him back in that relationship. And so that, that really made me kind of pause. I think it's, um, it ties in really well um, for us. And so, so I can stand up here today and say this is, this is you know, um, through, through my life and all the ups and downs and I've seen how God has worked. And... Again, knowing how everybody in this room is at different points in their life, you can say, well, that's great. You gave your little testimonial. Um, that's good for you. But, you know, my, my life is different. And, and, and so that's where I pause. It's like, okay, we need to go a little bit deeper and at least maybe look at about how is it that we know um, that what Jesus came is, was actually true. So, um, so I have a little interaction uh, thing. So I want everybody to, to close their eyes. And this isn't going to be one of those things where I forget to tell you to open your eyes and you're like holding your hands out and all of a sudden you open your eyes and no one's... No. So I, I, promise, promise, I trust you. Uh, you'll be, I'll, I'll tell you to open your eyes. So if you just close your eyes, maybe clear out a few things in your head, objects in your head, and uh, I want you to think about an object. And um, this, this, this big object I want you to think about is a triangle. Of all things, a triangle. Um, it can be whatever triangle you want. It can be whatever color you want. But I just want you to think of a triangle. All right, so open your eyes. So who's brave enough to maybe explain what their triangle looked like? Not all at once, please. <laughs> Don't make me call on you. Caitlin. <laughs> Mine was purple. <laughs> okay, a purple triangle. What, what, what did it look like? What did the uh, sides look like? Thin. Very thin? How many? What do you, what do you mean a thin? thin? Thin. What? Were all the, all the sides the same length? Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Purple equilateral triangle. <laughs> it probably says a lot about your personality. It's <laughs> yes. very centered. And, all right. Anybody, did anybody think of a different triangle than Caitlin? Danielle? A wide base. What's that? A wide base. A wide base? Do you know what we call the wide base triangle? No, I don't remember. Well, I'm an engineer. Sounds a little strange. Oh, wait, well, so what color is yours? I don't think I have a color. No color, alright. What about a guy? Aaron? Oh, um, it was uh, obtuse on the bottom and it was actually made out of wood. Oh, something that was actually made out of a specific uh, material. That's interesting. So I got, I got one question. So all your triangles, you had three sides, right? Did anybody in here think of a four-sided triangle? I think of Bill Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm not that deep. <laughs> so that, that's really important is that, okay, we use our imaginations. We all came up with different answers, but no one came up with a four-sided triangle, right? Because, and this sounds silly, bear with me for, for a little bit here, is that, you know, a four-sided triangle, a triangle is in, inconceivable. You know, no matter if you just spend all your time in the world trying to think what a four-sided triangle would be, there's no such thing because there, there are kind of rules or things that we have been, you know, we have studied and underst understood about what a triangle, what defines what a triangle is. So, we can use imagination to come up with our own triangle, but there are rules, there are things that, that you know, could conflict with what you imagine, and that would you know, make what you imagine not true, right? So I, I think maybe you can see where I'm going to go with this. I'm not going to be talking about triangles the whole night, but you know, focusing on God, it's, it's really not that far different from, from how we view God, because I think if we all closed our eyes and imagined who God was and went around the room, everybody would paint like kind of a different picture, right? 
you know, maybe the paint, like, you know, how um, how he serves others or how he, how he loves and, and other people would focus on the physical side of God. And this really draws the conclusion of kind of who God is. God is God's everything. Um, he, he can't just be defined by one one little thing. Um, and, and philosophically, it's actually why God is actually very simple because it's not he's not a combination of a few things. He's everything all put together and everything all at one. And so the big challenge is that you know it's really hard for us to comprehend that big picture, right? And so using our imagination is actually something that we need to do when we think about God. Now the, now the atheist in here will be like, oh, here we go, you're, you're saying you're using your imagination, you're just creating something else. But back to the triangle thing is that there are certain things where God has revealed to us that we can't imagine things that are inconceivable about God. And so that, that's the part of the, I'm kind of going to dig into a little bit about, um, you know, how is it that we can, you know, think about God and not think about inconceivable thoughts about who God is. And so, is this easy? No way. <laughs> you know, the greatest minds in the world, you know, spend, you know, their whole life, you know, coming up with, you know, uh, all, all kinds of theological thoughts, and, and we study them. Um, but, but for us, I mean, that's where life is about, is about seeking God. And it's not really a day that you just like, boom, right? I stop God and, and everything is, uh, I know who he is, and we just live life a different way. It's, it's, it's constantly a journey about learning more and more about who God is. So, so I, I kind of, so the, the heart of my message is that there's kind of two areas of how we get to uh, explore something we don't understand. So what, what is a very, one, in this, especially in this day and age of information like within our hand, how is it that you find information about a topic? What's the most popular answer? <laughs> Google it, yeah. Or in the old fat, did you, did you have books or was that even, were you have more books? Yeah, they were. Cold, yeah. yeah. So you even might even go to the library and read books about what other people have said about a given topic. And the, the whole reason why you do that, the whole reason why you do that, if you, you're thinking to yourself, is that I bet someone has already come up with an answer to this question I have, and I don't want to reinvent the wheel, or you know, I don't want to be wrong, and so I'm going to research that. And so we're using our minds, right? And, and that's that's a very very important thing uh, because God gave us you know a mind to understand. Um, you know, truths, and uh, so so that's one thing that we do. What, what's what's another popular thing that we do when we you know are struggling with decision and, and we, we're trying to find an answer? Consult yeah. others. Consult others. I, I would put that more like you're trying to understand. So that's kind of using your mind a little bit. Is that you're trying to get information from someone else that's going to feed into you. What else? What's a, what's a very common phrase about how you have to make a really tough decision? People say, right, uh, sleep on flip it. A coin. <laughs> flip a coin. Flip a coin. Follow your heart. Yeah, yeah, heart. So, that, so now we're now we're focusing on our on what's that? I said instinct. But no. oh. Yeah. So it's it's follow your heart. I mean, I, I think a lot of people have heard that. It's like, okay, you got to make a decision. You got to follow your heart. And and we're, we'll, we'll dig into like, okay, how does it what does it mean to follow your heart? Um, but, but my point, so we had two big things, and I, I guess the, the only takeaway that you have tonight is that we need to think that those aren't mutually exclusive. You know, we, we, you know uh, like, like, it, like it says in Scripture, we, you know, we love the Lord our God with our, our whole mind and our whole heart. It's not, there wasn't an or in there. And uh, I, I say that because I, I think we get in trouble in making um, decisions in life when we just focus on one or the other, right? I mean, how many people have been in a relationship where you think it's like perfect, right? I mean, everything your heart says that is good, but maybe you're missing a lot of the warning signs of you know, the things that you're doing. You're, you're all heart and you're, you're not all mind there, right? Or, uh, you know, another good example is even in Jesus' time, you know, all the scribes uh, that were there, I mean, they had the letter letter of the law right in front of them, and they knew that thing inside and out, and here Jesus comes, and their hearts were so closed off that, you know, they, they kind of missed him coming and going type of thing, but they're because they were so focused on understanding what was written in, in some book that they thought described exactly who God was. And so, um, in, in another example I kind of thought of, um, 
and, and bear with me until the entire end of this because I don't want people to say, oh, my, my gosh, what is he saying here? How many people have said, oh, you know, the, uh, when we need to find answers, we go open the Bible, right? Has anybody heard that? Open Scripture. Well, how many people, if, if you haven't had a Scripture background, uh, all of a sudden you know, read the, the Bible cover to cover by yourself without any help at all? Well, I, I guess I can raise my hand because I've done that once. Because it's like, oh, what? You know, this is a very fascinating book, right? And so you, I, I actually started the gospel, so I didn't start like uh, in, a, in a bad area that would have been really hard. And for, for every day in the morning, for like 10 minutes, I read four or five pages a day. And, and within a year, you can get through the entire Bible. And, you know, for me, it, um, you know, because I've gone to the greatest university in America, you know, I, I feel like I can. I comprehend, you know, books, you know, and, you know, I'll tell you what, after a year, there was a lot of things that maybe jogged my memory of, of, of things, but there was, there was a lot of confusion, right, because I was just by myself, and I'm just trying to understand what's in front of me, and, you know, we, we can talk about scripture, that would be a great theology on top, you know, the, the topic, uh, scripture itself, and, but the hardest part about reading the Bible is that it all goes together, and so when you're reading one thing, and you don't really have a, the foundation of everything else that happens behind there, you're going to miss a lot. And so I, so I pause there for a second. I'm not anti-scripture at all about, you know, definitely uh, read scripture. But there's an important aspect of it is that, you know, basically we need a good teacher to help us understand what is it that we're reading. So what's, what's, the, uh, what's the part of Mass right after the Gospel? What's that called? The homily. The homily, right. So... <laughs> Do you, do you understand what the homily is supposed to be about? It's like we, we actually read three different readings. We read something from the Old Testament, New Testament, and Gospels. And, and believe it or not, if you stayed, uh, paid attention all the way through that, there was actually probably a common theme between all those readings. And then, then hopefully with a, with a, a good priest uh, or, or, or deacon, um, he tries to give like a kind of a summary about what is it that would help us understand what we just heard. Because, I mean, this was the Word of God. And uh, so that, that's one example of, of how we can incorporate, you know, how do we learn scripture for, to get closer to God. Um, so probably the, the best example uh, that I can kind of pull that, that, that worked really, really well is, is actually the, uh, the saint of, of my, my, my namesakes, you know, St. Paul. And I think everybody would quickly tell that his conversion story, right? He was on a horse persecuting uh, followers of Christ, and all of a sudden he gets knocked off his horse, he's blinded, and then he, he goes, and all of a sudden he can see, and he has this big conversion experience. And then, you know, uh, maybe some of us know, in, in the New Testament, he, he wrote a lot of letters in there. And my guess is that we probably have this image that, oh, he had this conversion experience, all this information just kind of flowed in him, and he just went off writing these beautiful letters that we read, you know, 2,000 years later. What we, what we don't understand is that Paul spent the next several years learning from the apostles, the people who knew, um, uh, you know, the, who spent time with Jesus to really figure out, okay, who is this person that, that, that you know, got, uh, that knocked me off this horse? And so he, he did spend time, uh, you know, trying to learn more about the faith and about what had, had Christ had revealed to him. Um, and then he went out, and you know he, he's, he's more credited for you know reaching out to the Gentiles. And so when, when he was going out, he's very prepared because he had the knowledge in his in his mind, and then also from his conversion experience, uh, you know he had the he had Christ in his heart that he was able to, to go and, and make disciples of, of you know other nations outside of where they were. And so I think that's really important and a great example we have to think about is that, you know, Paul was using his mind and his heart at the same time. It wasn't all one or the other. And I think that's a really big thing that we have to do in our life. Um, so so that, the how part, right? Um, so how do you think that we use our minds to learn more about God? What, what's one place that we can go to that we know that we, we go and that that's going to be the um, going to deliver us the truth? The church. So I'm sure there's lots of other answers, but on my notes, I wrote down the church as for this example. <laughs> 
So, the, so what is the sole reason of the church? And I should pause it for a second. Let me maybe define church and be another great theology on tap discussion. Like, okay, what is the church? So capital C H U R C H. And we could have a whole discussion about, you know, okay, is this, are you talking about the Catholic Church or are you talking about all this? But let's pause for a second. You know, I, I started off with, with, with talk saying that, hey, um, yes, we are divided, um, but there's only one Jesus, and, and there's only one church underneath Jesus. And, and uh, the, the, yes, there are some semantics of like we have disagreements now, we're, we're divided at times, but, but we have to remember we are the, the one body of Christ. And what that means, well, we can say that for another another conversation talk. Um, so when I let's say church tonight, I'm just going to speak boldly, uh, broadly about uh, the, the Church of Jesus Christ. So, so what is the sole responsibility of the church? To make saints. To make saints. Yeah. So how? How do they make saints? Okay, you're getting, you're getting a little bit closer. How, how, do you, how do you make disciples? Evangelization. Evangelization, that's a good word. So what does evangelization mean? Spreading the good news. Spreading the good news. Spreading the good news. So the whole reason, the whole purpose of the church is to spread, to transmit this deposit of faith that was given to them onto others. And, and you know, probably the, the famous question is, okay, why, you know, why did Jesus only, why was his ministry only three years? Well, he came, he got a group of followers, he taught them, laid his hands on them, and said to go out. And so, to me, it's, it's the most perfect way of trying, of God trying to get everyone in together, is that he's, you know, it'd be very easy to have some guy come down and just be in this constant, internal, living source that, you know, we just go to, and we just ask questions, and he asks, but that, that, that's not, you know, they're... We'd be looking at, at, at that person as, as somebody higher than us or someone not equal to us, and, and we'd be kind of a slave to kind of whatever he said. And so the, the, the whole point of Jesus being you know, rising from the dead is that he, he is alive in all of us who, who believe in him. And, um, and so after, after he, he put that on apostles, and the apostles had this deposit of faith, and their, their sole job was to try to you know, um, speak that message through every through everybody, and so that is what the church' sole responsibility is: is to keep that deposit of faith and to transmit it to future generations. Now we, we can pause and say, okay, well, I know there's been bad bad popes, and, and you know the church has been corrupt, and I would say absolutely, our church is not a church of, of sinless people. I mean, we we are sinners, and um, even even the. the People have fancy out, outfits on, every, that, that wear that every day, and um, they're, they're as much of a sinner as I am. But they have been called to, to, to be instructed to, to, to carry that deposit. And the really cool thing about even the most corrupt times, and I guess I'm speaking of the, corrupt, the, the Catholic Church, um, those, those popes, if you really studied what they did from a, from a doctrine and, and, a, and, and you know, what they did for the church itself, they really didn't do anything because they were so caught up in themselves and the power that they were just, you know, more focused on, on, on their life at that given time that they really didn't do anything. But conversely, some of our greatest saints that the church has came out of those time periods when the church was, you know, as, as dead as can be, you could say. And, and we're, we're still, you know, learning, um, you know, what they tried to teach to others. And so for me, I, that, that, that's a testament that our church is truly being led by the Holy Spirit. Not, yeah, the, the, the Pope is, is a symbol of, of, the, of that spiritual leader that we have at this present time. But, but our, the head of our church is Jesus. And, um, and, and through the Trinity, the Holy Spirit is what's leading this entire church through, through time and, and, and trying to build others up into, the, up into his kingdom. So... Um, and, and so when we were really struggling with, like, you know, a certain kind of teaching, um, you know, back to the heart, you know, if, if you really just focus on, hey, I, you know what, I, this is really difficult for me, I'm just going to, you know, go off to my side and, and get a cup of coffee and just think about it to myself. But who do you think that you would trust? You know, your knowledge of, of being around this earth 20 or 30 years, or maybe what 
lot of people said over the last 2,000 years how to save on the topic. And, I, and I, I, could, I could talk about a whole list of things that I always, you know, really challenged me about the, the church teaching. But the, the beauty that, that I found is that when I actually took the time to actually study what the church says, not just like, okay, the final conclusion. It's easy to go down the cliff notes or say, okay, what is the church teaching? And then you get my call. That's, that's so wrong, and what are they doing? But then you actually read the body of that and how they came up to that conclusion. There's so many times I've I just been blown away by thinking like, oh, that's, that's why you know, we, we teach this. Um, and and I, I think, i got to think in here, there, there's lots of topics that we, that we struggle with um, in terms of the, you know, what, what is the teaching and, and you know, why, is, you know, why is this group believing the, the way they do. But the challenge of that is like, have, have you really spent the time to think about that in your mind? Obviously you came up you know, with what your heart says by yourself. Uh, but, you know, did you really study and, and think about what has already been revealed from the people who have already tried to answer that question? You know, it's kind of the part of the, the Googling part. You want to Google, okay, why did people came, you know, come up with this? So, so that is definitely the, the one area, is, is how to challenge, you know, your mind a little bit. And that's, that's what I would say the church is there for. They're there to help us interpret what God has revealed to us. Um, even particularly scripture, right? Um, you know, we, we can easily read scripture, and if you didn't have any foundation of what that means, you can go off in different directions about what it means to yourself, a your personal interpretation. And, and yeah, there is an interpretation of like, okay, that, that's relatable to my life, but there is there is a core message um, that, that God has revealed in that, and that's what we go to the church to help us interpret the true meaning of that. And, and there is a reason why we have 40,000 uh, non denominational or uh, you know, Protestant churches now because you know you get to a point one person kind of gets at odds with what they read and, and I'm simplifying this I know um, and then they, they go start another church because it's like okay well we like every you know we like 90 percent of what you have but this last 10 percent we really think that there's something different there and so another another church starts up with that and good, definitely good intentions I don't I don't want to definitely bad mouth you know. Um, their intentions of, of trying to follow, um, you know, what is what is true to them in their heart and in their mind, um, but but there would also be an argument of why I, I put a lot of faith in the, in the Catholic Church. So, uh, you know, enough about the, the church. And so you're probably thinking, okay, where does the heart part come in? So how is it that um, we allow our hearts into that equation of, of making it right or wrong? What 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 is it that we do? Someone said it earlier. What's that? Receive the sacrament. Uh, um, well, that, that's definitely a very powerful thing. But what, but what's something that you do in the, in the, in the, either privately or, or publicly? Pray. Pray. That's a big, big four-letter word, I know. Um, but this is where prayer comes into it. So. If, if I had uh, some kindergartens up here, maybe help me come up with a definition of what prayer is in the simplest form. What really is prayer? Talking to God. Having a conversation with God. And so what, what does having a conversation mean? There are two parts of a conversation that we're about communicating. Two speaking and listening. What, what's that? Everyone ever <laughs> What's that? Speaking and listening. Speaking and listening, right? So that, that is truly what prayer is really about. So God actually wants us to, to vent, you know, exactly what our emotions are and, and really what's near and dear to our heart. Um, he wants to say it, say it all. And then equally, He also wants us to listen. And so that's that's the part we're probably separated earlier is that we're, a lot of times we follow our heart, you know, you know, we, we probably have to stop and think about it. It's like, okay, we're, you know, where is God in that that, that um, so, so prayer is really big, and you know, I, I teach um, uh, confirmation class to, to freshmen and sophomores, and, and that's kind of the first thing that I that I tell all the students in there is that you know, over the next you know two years, we're going to learn all these kind of you know mind things about you know what is it that the church really <coughs> believes, right? And and probably in our culture about you know school is all about memorizing and understanding the facts. Uh, truly appreciate 
you know, what, what, who God is, is that we also have to open our hearts. And we do that by prayer. And so anytime we do, uh, you know, try to learn more, we need to find a way to incorporate prayer into that, or else it's just going to be a bunch of rules. You know, my non-Catholic friends, uh, you know, they, they often say, uh, or even non-Catholic or, or people who don't, don't go to church at all, it's like, okay, you know, the Catholic Church is just too many rules. I just can't keep up. And it's, that's not what the Catholic Church is at, at all about. It's, it's about, um, you know, trying to transmit what they know to be true unto us and allow us to live our life according to what they, uh, they know is true through God, um, since the church was founded by Christ himself. And so, so prayer is that time to really enter God into the equation in your heart and, and, and dig into that. Um, and, and probably the, the best example of, of, of prayer, when you stop and think about it, is that you know, often we get very frustrated when our prayers aren't answered. Um, but if, if you're really not praying to God, in essence, how, how are you ever going to know if your prayers are ever answered to start with? You know, God, God wants us to, to hear what is it that, that we want and you know, the desires of our heart. And then when things happen in our life, I mean, that's when we see things, oh, well, that's, that's where God was kind of directing me. And it's a tremendous amount of patience. Uh, it's not something that I, if, if you don't have a big prayer life, I wouldn't just spend, you know, start taking hour chunks each day and, and doing prayer. I mean, it's, it's something, it's, it's, we have to practice at that, right? Uh, we have to practice at having, you know, um, a conversation. Because ultimately, what, what is that, um, what, what are you really having with God in, in prayer? Other than a conversation, so you're having this day in, day out. What, what do we call that? Relationship. Relationship. And you know, we can say that the our sole, you know, purpose is to go to heaven, which is absolutely true. I mean, that that is our salvation path. But there's something bigger than what God wants, and it's something what He wanted from the very beginning is just a relationship with us. He wants us to love Him back, just like He loves us. And yeah, heaven's important, and, and, and Another Catholic apologetic kind of point is that, that that's why you don't find a lot of Catholics going around and, and saying, you know, are you saved? Because, yeah, that, that is a, um, a valid question, but you know, we're, we're living presently, and really presently we should be thinking about, you know, do you have a relationship with Christ? And that's, um, that's really the heart of, of what God wants, is that he's not going to force us to love him, you know, love him back. I mean, that, that's the... That's the definition of love. Anything that you're you're forced to do uh, isn't love. Um, so hopefully the heart and the mind and you know the, the church is, is linked to how we can understand uh, our mind better and then um, or, you know, use our mind to understand God's uh, God's love better. And prayers is how we can use our heart to understand who God is. So so finally, um, the kind of the last. Section um, last part I have is like ultimately there's one big truth question that that we have to ask ourselves is that who really is Jesus and and C.S. Lewis kind of came up with a with a neat way to, to kind of look at the at the at how you can answer that question so the first one is you know is, is Jesus a liar you know was he not incarnate of God but he was actually incarnate of the devil devil and came and did this big thing and is just drawn us all into this hope thing, and then when we die, we're going to find out that we're fools type of thing. So, I mean, that, that you know, from a uh, from one point of view, that, that could be one option, right? Another one would be a lunatic. Uh, you know, some of my, uh, one um, friend from high school who's an atheist now, and, and you know, he, he was really mad about something, and he, he said, well, I, you know, I understand the Gospels better than these religious teachers, and and I, I kind of question that because, you know, this was a man who said he was God himself. I mean, it wasn't even like a gray area about, well, maybe he was, he didn't exactly say that. This was a man that said that he was God. And so, if that's not true, kind of isn't everything that he did in his in his ministry, um, you know, kind of silly. You know, that he, he was just coming up, yeah, he was a really nice guy, but um, there's something bigger than that. And the final thing is, uh, the third L is Lord. And what, what is a good definition of what what is a lord? Master. The master. So what what what? How would you view what is a master? 
who is a master? Uh, someone you serve. Someone you serve. Someone who kind of has like total authority over you, right? And so, you know, that, that's what our faith really says who Jesus is, is our Lord. And you open in Philippians and, and uh, it clearly says that, you know, um, you know, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. And that's that's the heart of you know what all our all our church you know, all the churches we have right now is that's that's really the, the heart of the gospel is that we confess that you know this Jesus person we don't think that he's a liar we don't think he's a lunatic but by his works and the fruit of, of what he's done is that he's actually our Lord he's someone that has full authority over us and then the word authority is you know. Uh, Probably gets people uneasy. It's like, wait, wait a minute, you know, I, I get to I get to pick what I want to do, right? And um, really, when when you understand who kind of God is in your life, and you allow Him to, to, to kind of steer you in your life, I mean, it's all of it. It's not not just like small chunks of it. It's it's you know, it's, it's uh, offering your entire life up, you know, and allowing Christ to live live inside you. And so, uh, unfortunately, there's probably another answer that that C.S. Lewis, you know, could have put in there. Which is really the, how I began the, began this talk was that a lot of people probably just say I don't know. I mean, it's one thing to say the truth is in one of those three options, and that's you know that is true. But what really is is what we struggle with, and um, is that we don't know the answer. And so, um, so the question would be is okay, you, you don't know where where are you going to find which of those three answers is true, and. Um, I mean that that you know that that is my prayer for you know so many people that you know aren't aren't tied to their you know any faith or, or really kind of struggle with you know who is this you know, you know who is God and who is church is it real or is it not? Um, but but it does have to be one of those three. You know the gospels weren't just a story about how to live a good life. It was about recognizing that you know because of our sinful nature, Jesus took that all on and. and um, we're, we're not bound by sin, and that, that's a really that's a really big deal. <laughs> um, so 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 finally, uh, you know, finally at the end, end here, and um, so I, I, because I know everybody's at different different walks of, of their faith journey, you know, right now in life, um, I guess a few things that you can try to think about is it's okay to imagine who God is. Now, then the next part after that would be okay, what. How are you going to know that you know you're not um, you're not imagining uh, inconceivable triangles, right? We, we want to imagine a God that is everything that we believe in is conceivable, and and He's left many clues, you know, throughout all of humanity that have been you know kind of recorded and shown, and then through prayer, when we see that our prayers are answered, that's, a, that's a kind of another testament that you're going to see for yourself um, how God works within you. And that's not something that happens overnight, right? Um, it is, it's a journey. Um, but, but that's really what I, I guess I ask you guys to do uh, leaving here tonight is, is open your minds. You know, love, love the Lord your God with your whole heart and your whole mind. It's those two things. It's not mutually exclusive, one or the other. Um, so there, there's one final quote from, from St. Uh, Augustine that is just like the heart of, I think, the, the balance between you know, trying to believe in something that you just can't prove by a science experiment. And uh, what he said is that I, uh, I I believe in order to understand, and I understand the better belief. I don't think you know everything about God in that in that given part of time, but there is there is that leap of faith a little bit, saying, you know what, I, you know, I, I believe that this is true, but then we don't stop trying to understand that further along in life, and so we're constantly trying to seek him. You know, our faith should be about seeking understanding. Just like Pilate, when he said, is like, okay, what is truth? I mean, he, he wants that answer. Because I, I, does everybody want to do right things in, in their life, you know? Uh, does everybody want to pick, you know, the right decisions about where you have to, where, you have, where are you going in your life? And um, I think that's a, that's a really big part uh, of how faith kind, kind of comes into that. Um, that, you know, we want, to, we want to believe and, and we, we seek understanding and those things go hand in hand. Um, so that, that's really 
that was my that was my my three pages of notes that I had. Hopefully it wasn't too long, but I don't know if anybody have any questions or thought or any thoughts that you you know kind of came to you that you wanted to maybe be bold and talk among others. So. Well, I really appreciate. It. Oh, Chris. Uh, I guess just building on that, talking about the prayer. <clears throat> In my freshman year of college, uh, somebody once told me, if you're having trouble believing, then act like you believe until you do believe. So just a matter of, uh, I guess that's the hard part. But. Uh, I think that's what, what faith is, is, is a response to, to, to a truth, right? And, and so you know, you're responding to something that doesn't mean that you, you fully understand or you know, fully, uh, fully believe, but you know, you're, you're going to respond to that and, and seek that out. I mean, that, you're going to seek out that understanding. So. Any other thoughts? All right. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight, and hopefully, I didn't bore you too much or, or anything like that. But I, I, um, I, I enjoyed coming here tonight, and. Uh, Many blessings to you throughout the evening and, and through your life. So.